Hey everyone, welcome. Jenna Sullivan here, and we are covering James chapter two, the second um, second session. And so we're on actually session number four. <laughs> so it's been a lot of fun, and I hope that you've enjoyed this. Um, this session is going to be a little bit different. I really could have gone in one of two directions, and I know, like, I could ask you, do you want to go the easier, nicer, more like? pleasant talk or do you want to go with the harder deeper more convicting talk um so i'm just gonna do the harder one right because when we think about it christianity christianity is easy and hard at the same time and um and i think sometimes you know we need a really good a good look at kind of reality so i have been prayerfully considering this one. I have been asking God to please protect the hearts of the hearers, to speak through me, to um, give me compassion and grace and love. Uh, let my words be encouraging and not just, um, you know, a conviction today. So are you ready? This one may be a little bit rough and I'm again prayerful that that it is a good one for you. So let's talk about authenticity. I, it's a kind of an interesting thing to me, authenticity, because I feel like it's sort of a buzzword and authenticity matters and everybody, you know, you need to be your authentic self and, you know, people can smell a fake a mile away. Um, you know, we people watch, we judge people. We tend to kind of, you know, look at the way someone dresses and make all sorts of assumptions about them. I remember, um, years ago, I was what's considered a wealth indicator profiler for uh, hotels, for the hotel industry. So I worked within the events hotel industry and I would go in and um, part of a service that I would provide to this mastermind group that I was, um, that I ran was that I would come in and help them profile, help them understand how to profile a wealthy person compared to someone who couldn't afford their services. <laughs> and it was interesting because it was always backwards. The, the girls who were selling the big, huge events to the big families, um, you know, if it was a new family coming in, they would look for wealth indicators that they thought were wealth indicators, but they aren't actually wealth indicators. So it's, it's funny, the, the wealthy people try to look poor so they can save as much money as they can, whereas the poor people try to look wealthy to look like they deserve to be there somehow. It's really a weird flop of things, but it's why the, the fakes industry is such a huge industry, right? There's so many fake everything, not only from our clothing to our purses, to our jewelry, but to, um, you know, our, the makeup we put on, the plastic surgery, the injections, you know, no judgment on anyone getting any of that stuff, but like any augmentation that you're doing to your body is because you're not happy, right? You, you want to be something that you're not. However, however, we're always trying to make it look real, right? Think that through. We're not going in for, you know, I don't know, lip injections or Botox or plastic surgery or breast augmentation or tummy tucks or any of that. We don't go in to want to come out and look like we got work done, right? I, I hear my friends always saying like, I'm looking for the doctor who's going to make me look the most natural. <laughs> like I've had work done, but nobody can tell. So. It's the same thing with fakes. How can we do the best fake, you know, get the best, we joke in our household about Louis Vuittons, right? How can you spot a fake Louis Vuitton? There are some really good fake ones out there because they know the indicators now, you know, how they're lining up everything perfectly and, you know, certain indicators that you want to look for, you know, it's an interesting thing that, that they're trying to fake it so well that even the most discerning eye can't tell. Okay, what... What does that look like though for say our faith? And I think about proof of life. I think about my own child where I would, you know, I, I had him, I was excited about this new baby and, you know, I would run into his room in the, in the middle of the night because I would have some panic attack that he wasn't living. And I would look and look for that little chest to rise and fall, you know, the little belly to rise and fall to see any movement, right? Proof of life. Proof that he was there, proof that he is growing, you know, a guarantee, something. <laughs> so when I think about 
you know, my faith and I think about, uh, is it sort of more of a, yeah, I want everything else in my world to be authentic, the real McCoy, the real deal. I want to make sure, you know, my kid is alive, that nobody's sick, everybody's good. But when it comes to our faith, how often are we, you know, are we sometimes like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Wait, what, what, man? So, you know, I think about 2 Corinthians 3, 5, 13, 5, excuse me. <clears throat> excuse me, that says, examine yourselves to see <clears throat> whether you are in the faith. Now I'm going to warn you real quick. Whenever I do a video like this, uh, a talk like this, I get spiritual warfare like crazy. <clears throat> so it's no wonder I'm like losing my voice here. Um, so if you can pray, pray, pray that the talk goes well today in the live session, but also here. Um, so examine yourselves, whether to see that, see, whether to see you are to see whether you are in the faith, right? This is an important verse. We need to examine ourselves. Again, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. And when I think about James chapter two, there's a very interesting verse in there. It says, um, James 2, 19 says, you believe God is one, you do well. So I think James is sort of saying that a little tongue in cheek, if I'm being honest. I, I honestly think James is, saying, hey, you believe God is one, you do well. You know, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where people of those that day, right, he was talking to <clears throat> the Israelites, he was talking to Jewish Christians of the day, right, these, these men and women who are now Messianic Jews. And it seems that people were claiming that, right, that they know God is one, because they believed the God of Moses, they believed that they could recite Deuteronomy 6, um, 4, right? It says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Um, the, Lord is our, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Um, and they felt like they were right with God. If, if they knew this, they could recite this. It was kind of like a, I know this, <clears throat> and therefore I'm in, <laughs> you know? So he's like, you know, you believe God is one. You do well. And then he follows that up with, but even the demons believe in shudder. It was like, wait a minute. Now you're putting me into the camp of the demons. Like, I feel like that was kind of a, a real heavy blow. So I want to kind of go down this road of shattering our potential false assumptions. You know, James shatters that false hope. He's comparing a kind of belief to a knowledge that Satan has and his demons have. Like that's a, that's a pretty big, you know, whack on, the, whack on the side of the head. So I wanna cover three things with you today, really to get serious about. We're gonna get serious about our belief, we're gonna get serious about our faith, and we're gonna get serious about our sanctification. So let's start with belief. Uh, in Last week's sermon um, from Pastor Rick Rodheaver uh, on cccLH.org. Uh, it's on, um, you know, the talk was about what do Christians, who do Christians think they are. And he brought up a, an analogy that I think fits today's lesson as well, but in a little bit slightly different manner. He talked about cancer. If you had cancer and you were going to die and you were going to different surgeons to, to help you, different people, different doctors, you would have one question for them. You would want to know, can you help me live? That's it. You wouldn't care what color their office was. You know, you wouldn't care what kind of music they were playing. This is, you know, he went into this whole thing on, it, it wouldn't matter to you. If the, if the answer was yes, that's what you need to know. If the answer is no, goodbye. None, none of the external things matter. And, you know, in James chapter two, he's talking about this, that these people were pandering to wealth. They were pandering to what others could maybe do for them based on their outward appearance. And based on maybe their good works and the deeds that they were doing, you know, so this is an interesting thing. And so if I were to take that a little one step further, we have to remember that I'm looking at what it is that is going to allow me to live, right? Can I prove that that surgeon, right? Can I see that that surgeon is going to actually allow me to um, live. However, I am putting my life in his hands, right? His or her hands. 
So I am not necessarily wondering if someone says yes or not, because anybody could say, yes, they can do something. I need to find proof that they can, right? I need to determine, do I believe in this person? I might see that they have a, a, a you know, degree on the wall and that they've written studies and that they've done all sorts of things. But I want to look at their track record. I want to look at personal testimonies. I want to see exactly if this person is qualified because I will be putting my life in their hands. Literally, I will be under the knife in their, you know, surgeon room and <laughs> hello. So if I look at that one step further, I think, okay, if they can't, if they can't provide that service well, and I don't believe in them, I can believe them. I can say, okay, I see that you're a doctor and I believe you that you're a doctor, but man, I don't really believe in you. I'm not going to put my life in your hands, right? So when we think about the church, when we think about our, our own life, we have to remember, you know, and this is what Pastor Rick Rodeheber said, is that the church is about making dead people alive. So that's my heart today, you guys, is to help make dead people alive. And I'm not talking about really dead people who are atheists. I'm talking about dead Christians. Like, is this an, even a thing? Okay, so we have to just not assume that we were the good soil. And particularly in the church, some of that may be what's considered the third soil. So I'm just gonna read for you real quick, Matthew 13. Um, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path. And the birds came and devoured them, right? That's like Satan and people coming after them, telling them, you know, are you stupid? And snatches them, right? They snatch them out. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground. It didn't have much soil, so it, it immediately sprang up. But then since the soil had no depth, when the sun rose, again, that's like people and, you know, kind of things, cares of the world that kind of scorched them they were scorched they had no root so they withered away other seeds fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up and choked them that's like again the, the, it's like the sadness of this is the third soil where life and money and you know people pleasing and loving this world the cares of the world like it's growing up alongside of you as a potential christian right you may have rooted but those things choked you out. And what I mean by that is realistically, the things of this world may be more important to you than the things of God. Like reading your Bible is like a chore. Praying is a chore. Oh, I forgot. Okay, but I'd rather watch Netflix. There's something new on Netflix. I'd rather, you know, talk about whatever the latest and greatest is in politics. You know, it's, it's like the cares of this world are choking you out and it proves what's called unfruitful. So we have to remember not to assume that we're the good soil, but in our belief, we have to consider, do I believe in Jesus or do I just believe Jesus, right? Because even the demons believe and they shudder. Think that through. That's heavy. Okay, I want you to get serious about your faith. Remember, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. So what does that look like? You know, how do we... How do we look at this in a deeper way? So my um, stepdad is, today is his death day. I don't, that, it's just an odd thing for me to say. I've never experienced this before, but um, today they are taking him off life support. He went into the hospital three weeks ago. He was in and out. He just had some kind of breathing issues and troubles and everything was good and they sent him home and then he went back in and they everything was good and they sent him home and now all of a sudden he's having organ failure and he's dying today and what I mean by that is they they there's nothing that they can do he's on a respirator he's in an induced coma and they're taking him off of life support so my mom and um his kids are going to be there and like today is his death day and all I think about is um is that man saved, you know? And I think that through with all of you, if you died today, if today was your death day, like, you know, my mom wrote a text saying like, today he graduates from this life into heaven. And I just, in my mind, I'm like, do, you know, how do we know? How do we know that? 
you know, did I see any fruit in his life? You know, I don't know. My, my husband's like, be careful, Jen, because you've already talked to her about this. Let, you know, be there for her. And I am. I mean, my mom has gotten to be there for this man. She infused Jesus back into his life for the last two years. She's only been married to him for two years. This is a new relationship. And I think, oh, how heartbreaking. So I sent her a text last night and I, you know, I thought I've been in my head. I've been in my head judging this whole situation, thinking like, can we wake him up? Can we make sure he's saved? You know, this whole thing of like almost, you know, I want to, I want to shake him and be like, get right with God, you know? <laughs> so like today is the day. <laughs> Could you imagine if today was your day? So I said, mom, what an honor and blessing it is. It has been for you to faithfully serve him for the past two years as his wife and incredible caregiver. What a huge job God has given you to be strong for this man and his entire family during his passing. You are strong and God has uniquely fashioned you for exactly a time as this. Rejoice, sister in Christ. Rejoice. And this is my mom. And she said, I needed that. Like I needed that. Thank you. You know, and that's, that's, you know, something that I want to encourage you guys on that my heart for talking about this, and I'm going to get into a deep, a deep verse here in just a second. We're not going to have so much time to go over everything, but in, you know, it's, it's hard. I want you to read Matthew seven today. It starts with the do not judge and all that. I want you to read the whole thing, but 21 says, you know, 21 through 23, it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did not we prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That is most likely the most frightening verse, verses in all of the, the entire Bible because it's talking to Christians. It's talking to would-be Christians. It's talking to people who identify as Christians. The way that leads to destruction is wide and many will enter. The way that leads to eternal life is narrow and few. So how do you define many and few? Well, many is more than 50% and few is definitely less than 50%. So few, it's not like he says many and some, it's like, what, few? So not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, he's talking about people who identify as Christians. And why I say that is because in the Old Testament and Matthew speaking to these people would know this, right? He's, he's Matthew is quoting Jesus here and Jesus speaking to the people know that, that this is what this means. When you say um, a name twice in the Hebrew culture, it means an intimate relationship. So if I said your name twice, it means like we know each other well. And that's what these people are saying. They're saying, Lord, Lord. And didn't we do all this stuff? Didn't we go to church? Didn't we help everybody? Didn't we do the things you asked us to do? And, and he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Like that's mind numbing. And imagine on your death day, being excited to hear, well done, good and faithful you know, daughter. And only to hear him say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawless worker. Okay, so I want you to get serious about your sanctification. Philippians 2.12 says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The Blue Letter Bible, um, like Strong's Concordance says that with fear and trembling, it's used to describe the anxiety of one who distrusts his ability completely to meet all requirements, but religiously does his utmost to fulfill his duty. So what does that look like? And I wanna just give you um, a, a tool to use. So this is a fruits audit. It's kind of, it's, it looks long, but these are just verses written out. There's 22 different fruit audits questions you can ask yourself and you can read the verses and just see. Um, one of the, the best ones, in my opinion, is number 22. Do you find assurance or conviction when you read all five chapters of the book of 1 John? So just go do that today. Go read the book of 1 John and um, read it in light of your own life and see how you feel like you kind of compare in light of the Bible. But there's a lot of different questions in here, like would a stranger or even a close friend or family member who is not a follower of Christ convict you 
in a court of law of being a Christian. And there's some verses there to back that up. Um, have, you know, has your spiritual life grown since last year? Can you see actual fruit? What is fruit? You know, fruit is being disciplined by God. Have you ever been reproved by God? Or are you just going through life and you sin and no, never, never get disciplined? You know, God disciplines his own kids. He doesn't discipline his not kids, you know? Um, there's so many things on here that I think can help you. Like, are you convicted when you sin? Does God allow tests and trials in your life? Do you get persecuted for your faith? Uh, do you have chronic sin? Is your character in line with the fruit of the spirit? You know, is your life defined by the spirit of the flesh? Do you intentionally disciple others? You know, do you love God with all that you are? Do you crave the word of God? Do you keep his commands? I mean, this list goes on and on. So I just wanted to end with just encouragement for you guys to take your faith seriously. I want you to get serious about who you're putting your belief in. Are you believing in Christ? Um, are you putting your life in his hands? Have you raised the white flag and, and that's it? Your life is his. I want you to get serious about your faith, right? What does that look like? Are, are you examining your faith? And I want you to get serious about your sanctification, your growth, your fruit. Do that fruit audit if you can, okay? So this you can find at um, 31oils.com forward slash UG free. I will also load it to the group so that you have it. But um, be blessed, sisters. And I hope that this, this was a helpful um, session for you and that you will pray uh, that God would give you clarity on this one. All right, be blessed.